Good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome to the next session at the ACT um, Festival. Um, the topic for today is reframing risk management for the 2020s and beyond. I think we've all come through a, a period where risks changed a lot from, from the previous uh, few years, and also a period in which, as businesses, we are expected to disclose the way we manage risk um, to, to our various stakeholders in rather more detail than we have done in the past. And of course, treasuries are, treasurers are very much at the center of all these discussions. So I'm delighted to be joined by a panel who have a very um, wide and varied experience of, of business and of uh, different areas of enterprise risk. And we shall be ranging from hedge funds to cyber, to, um, to logistical risks, um, all of which, of course, have been intensified during the last two years. I'd like, please, to invite my panelists to introduce themselves briefly um, after I perhaps should introduce myself also first. And I'm Charlotte Morgan, and I'm the Audit Committee Chair of uh, SMBC Bank International, which is the London-based bank for SMBC Group. I'm also on the board of Union Bank of India, UK, and also of some charities in the arts and education sectors. And I'm very proud to have been a recent vice president of the ACT. C could I turn to you, Kevin, to give us a, a brief um, summary of, of, of your role and responsibilities? Thanks, Charlotte, for having me, and pleasure to be here. Uh, so uh, I'm Kevin Cook. I'm one of the founders and the CEO of Treasury Spring, which is a London-based financial technology company in the cash management space. Um, I started my career uh, back in 2002 as a lawyer before moving to uh, a hedge fund in 2006, which is where I met my two business partners, um, working pre, during, and post the financial crisis. Pretty interesting time from a risk management perspective, lots of lessons learned, mostly of what not to do. Um, and then in 2010, we set up our first business, which was uh, an independent fixed income advisory firm. Um, we sold that to an asset manager in 2013, and then we founded Treasury Spring in, in 2016. And so for the last 10 years, really, I've been operating in what I'll call cash management or treasury investment, primarily in funding. Thank you. Lasse, could I invite you to give us a similar um, summary of your role and responsibilities? Thank you. Yes, I'm Lasse Visvendra and I'm the group treasurer of Cameron Group PLC, a FTSE 250 um, company. Um, I've been in treasury since 2002. I used to run the deaning room at BAE Systems and then worked my way up. Um, I also got involved in the crisis in 2008-9 and a lot of my lessons learned came from there. Uh, and part of today is to talk about what's, you know, what happened this time and, and what was different this time as well. Sure, indeed. Andrea, um, please tell us a bit about yourself. Thank you, Charlotte. First of all, thanks for having invited me to this uh, interesting round table. So I'm Andrea Sottoriva. I am the group uh, treasurer of CETA. Uh, CETA is a leader in providing IT services to the air, air, um, air transport industry, so mainly airlines and airports, but we also have governments as, as customers. Uh, we provide uh, basically a service all across the world. We are present in uh, 200, uh, 200 countries. Uh, we, have, uh, we have an exposure to more than 100 currencies as well across the world. Um, so I have a quite a diverse background. So I started in, in auditing, then moved into banking. Uh, first uh, in, in Italy, which is uh, my original country, and then I moved to London. I worked for Salomon Brothers in London. Then I moved back to Italy where I joined uh, General Electric uh, Capital. And then I joined CETA 14 years ago already. I believe for those of you, it may be interesting to, to discover that uh, the reason why I moved after the banking and I joined uh, General Electric was that because they were looking for someone with uh, an experience in Monte Carlo simulation risk management tools to be implemented in a non-banking environment. So back to you, Charlotte. Thank you. As our topic is um, 
focusing first on enterprise risk and then on how the treasury risks flow from that, I think it would be interesting to know from each of the panelists what were the key enterprise risks that their businesses faced. And speaking for myself um, and, and, and for my, my, my banking responsibilities, um, First of all, these were very much the risks that we are always aware of in managing, such as uh, liquidity risk, credit risk, and, and market risk. Um, but of course, very, very different circumstances from where we'd been even a few months before in, in terms of our expectations of, of how these risks would fall. Um, and, and then the other risk was working from home and how we would continue all our very complex operations with only a handful of people coming into the office. Uh, I think if, if you don't mind pan, for the panelists, I'll just ask you to sort of, we go around in the same order this time um, uh, and, 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 and ask for a summary of your enterprise risks. So starting with you, Kevin, please. Um, thanks very much, Charlotte. So um, we were, uh, I guess, to some extent, fortunate going into the pandemic in that we're a relatively small team. Uh, we're a tech company by background, and so we kind of had to be set up to work from home. Um, and so we sort of all plugged in on whatever it was, the 23rd of March, and it was as if we were we were in the office, I think. And so from a, we didn't have some of the same issues as some of the larger organizations from that perspective. But as you worked through the pandemic and you started to try and understand how does the business operate in this remote environment, um, what you realize is that there is definitely operational risk, which is harder to manage when you're not in the, the same room. Um, you know, there's also um, what I'll call personal risk in terms of trying to understand and feel how team members, how people are getting on, um, you know, how people are coping with the various challenges that were being thrown at them. That sort of stuff is much harder to pick up through remote. And it might not feel like kind of an important risk factor because it's not credit risk or liquidity risk or FX risk or interest rate risk or all the things we typically think about. But if you don't have a good view for how your team is operating, how your team's interacting, how your team's feeling, that does then start to impact a bunch of those other operational risks that we have. So from our perspective, you know, we were um, fairly well prepared in terms of a lot of the traditional risks that you might have expected um, from, uh, you know, from a, a major crisis. In fact, to some extent, because of the nature of our business, um, we were beneficiaries of that. So, you know, part of what we do as a platform is to help people to manage credit risk, to help people to diversify, to help people to get access to government assets, as well as just pure bank assets, to help people to get access to secured um, cash investments, as well as unsecured. And so as a business, we were sort of net beneficiaries because we kind of have developed what we do for the very time that people might need it in, in crises like this. But from an operational perspective, you know, we were helpful because we were small, but no different to lots of other businesses in that there were certainly things that we hadn't foreseen that we had to try and manage. Thank you. Lasso, what's your view, your perspective on this? Yeah, thank you. Um, so for us, we're a manufacturing business um, based, we've got about 13 sites where people are across the world. And I guess the sort of at a top level, the biggest risk we faced was business continuity. Because at the time we went into lockdown, we didn't actually know if we we're going to be able to continue working or not uh, on a lot of our sites. So from a top level management point of view, it was very much a, what does that mean? And that then drove the kind of treasury risks like liquidity, as you mentioned, as in, if we weren't going to be open, how long, how long were the funds going to last to be able to manage that risk? So ours is very much operational in that sense. Um, we were lucky with our customer base that within three weeks of lockdown, we were told we were critical national infrastructure, but we had to wait to hear you remember all the confusion government-wise at the time as to instruction about how we were to proceed. And we're based in um, the UK, Australia, Norway and America. And we had to hear that from all of our governments to allow us to go back, well, not go back into work for some people, but also work from home and how that was going to work. So that was our top level risk, if you see what I mean. And then the Treasury risk kind of followed from there. Uh, and we then faced, uh, what do we do in a liquidity sense? As you, we talked about before, we kind of reverted back to what we learned in 2008, 9 
in terms of drawing facilities, making sure the cash was with us, um, and then kind of working through what other um, risk mitigation tools we might need. So, um, yeah, slightly different. You know, we've got 2,000, 2,500 people across the world that we had to keep safe, but also manage. So um, quite a complex operation to run. Thank you. And Andrea? Well, first of all, uh, COVID was the worst crisis in the history of the airport mm -hmm. transport industry. So you can imagine how it has impacted us. Uh, so it's something uh, no one has ever seen before. Okay, so um, just to give you some numbers, uh, the, the passengers on the flights uh, last year dropped by 80%, what we say 77% across the world. And uh, starting from March 2020, basically there was, uh, basically the whole uh, transport was brought to a halt. So from one day to another, we moved from having uh, uh, growth prospects of double digit every year to zero. But when I say, I mean zero, I mean really zero. So the first um, priority for me was by far the liquidity risk. Okay. So we had to do a lot of simulation and understand uh, for how long we would survive without any sort of revenues, zero. Um, so that was by far the biggest risk we faced. Um, and at the same time, I started to receive calls from our banks uh, asking us if we wanted to, to draw from our credit facilities. And therefore, for me, the next uh, big uh, risk uh, assess was the counterparty risk, which we can see from different angles. So the counterparty risk, because the banks, uh, some of them were heavily impacted, and therefore I had to review also the business we have with that but also our, our customers. So our customers are mainly in airlines and airports. And as you may, may remember, uh, they really suffer significantly. Uh, some of them have uh, approached the COVID uh, crisis with very short uh, uh, cash available. So many of them started to draw from their credit facilities. Some of them went into bankruptcy. So for me, also counterparty risk was really, really uh, important. So to summarize, I think we can discuss also all the other risks. But when we talk uh, enterprise risk management, I think we need to see also the interactions among the different risks. And for me, the liquidity risk and the counterparty risk were the two major ones by far. Back to you, Charlotte. Thank you. And at this point, um, I would uh, love to invite everybody who's watching to put their questions into the Q&A because um, we would like to hear from you and make sure that we're answering the topics that are of interest to you. And in fact, we have a question already, which is, how have you changed your approach to risk scanning and risk management? And I think perhaps um, for me, um, introducing from the perspective of my company, um, like most banks, we had a pretty sophisticated risk management system. Um, people have talked about the lessons from 2008, and I think the, um, the much tighter capital and liquidity requirements across the whole banking and financial services market uh, definitely helped us because at the end of the day, these markets, are, all the participants in these markets are, are, are closely, uh, are working closely together and you're really only as strong as the weakest link as we saw in 2008, but that those sorts of 2008 problems didn't arise, um, I'm pleased to say. Um, partly helped, of course, by prompt um, government intervention. Um, in, in terms of our um, approach to risk scanning and risk management, I think we did benefit from being an Asian bank in that um, the, the, um, the Asian countries were much more aware of the risk of pandemics because they went through SARS and other pandemics over the last, uh, well, maybe not pandemics, but epidemics over the last um, 10 years. So they, they knew what sort of things would happen. And in fact, our um, parent company in Japan was already restricting business travel and, um, and asking us to draw up 
working from home plans, even from quite early in January 2020. Um, but I think in terms of how has, how has our approach changed, our fundamental approach is, is similar, but I think we are much more alive to unexpected risks and to how the, um, how, how the global economy is, 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 is closely intertwined and, and problems can, can spread very fast from, from one country to another. And that's not just pandemics that we could talk about supply chains and um, geopolitical risks, but I think that would be the overall lesson that, that we as a bank have learned. I wonder, Lath, if I could go to you with this, this question of how have you changed your approach to risk scanning and risk management? So the company has um, been managing risk quite extensively prior to, to this event. Um, we're a company that has um, very significant health and safety aspects to our company, and that can impact our operations. So there's a lot of work that goes on at board level to pull that sort of uh, risk framework together and review it. And it's reviewed monthly and it's reviewed regularly. Um, and everyone below that has a risk um, plan as well that then builds up into it. So in essence, when we then were, were forced into the crisis, we kind of energize that process to be more than monthly, if you see what I mean. It then became a, a, a literally a weekly session with all the MDs and FDs and senior players on a Zoom call like this, actually discussing what their various risks were around the business so that the likes of a treasurer like me can then look at that and feed that in to work out what I need to do next. And therefore, what we you know, what are, what are the things I then need to do to help mitigate that? So it was effectively more presence together um, each week so that we could discuss the issues we we're facing at each point in time. So um, the fact that we were able to work from home fairly rapidly at that level was, was really good. We actually all had laptops and everything. It's just that at the time there was more of a culture of needing to be in the office, if those remember those days. Um, whereas now working from home is acceptable. Whereas culturally it was a bit more, oh, you know, you only work from home by exception. This time around we were working from home because we had to and it all worked. Um, so I think ours is more just the actual, repet you know, the, the more times we actually viewed the risks because the risk could change week by week by week for us. Um, so that was that was the key challenge for, for that. And then me taking over, and we've talked about it before, the main risk by any means for us was liquidity. That's the first thing that comes up. So, so that's the one we addressed first. Thank you. Andrea, have your processes changed? Well, as I mentioned earlier, first of all, no one has ever seen anything like this before. So it was, uh, you know, an, a new experience for everyone. Sometimes, Charlotte, I think um, we should see um, our companies from outside, not just from a treasury or finance point of view. So when we approach these, uh, this crisis, we were forced to uh, review all our interactions because as we said, we started to work from home, but uh, we had to react immediately, okay, to review all our cost structure. So we started to have uh, finance management uh, calls uh, at least uh, once a week, twice a week to review how we could adapt to uh, a significant lower level of revenues, right? So the exercise that we've done was uh, twofold. First, we understood uh, what were the drivers of our revenues, because we are an IT provider for the, the industry, which was suffering a lot. And we, we, we had to understand how much the impact of the passengers decrease impacted our revenues. 
Second, all the other components of our revenue. So how much of our revenues, for example, is driven by projects and how much it is fixed already, how much it is already contracted. And then once we have uh, addressed the, the revenues, we start reviewing the cost. And, uh, and, uh, and then we started to handle the, the working capital, right? So handling the requests we were receiving from our uh, customers to delay in payments with the ones with our suppliers. So we handled the, the working capital. Uh, and then uh, in the end, uh, um, what we have done is that uh, what we have achieved was basically the that the interactions between the treasury department, but I would say the finance department and the rest of the business increase a lot because we came up with a completely new uh, view on the business, okay, that required um, a, a consistent update. So, for example, regarding our exposure uh, to the, the currencies in the past, we relied on, on the numbers of the year before, so on the historics. And now from day, from one day to another, we couldn't rely on the past anymore. So this prompted us to have regular conversation with the geographic areas to understand what we could expect from, uh, from uh, the, the, the currency exposure and therefore end up with uh, with the hedging. <coughs> Sorry. And then, uh, and then, uh, liquidity risk, as I mentioned, is was by far the biggest one, and therefore this prompted a, a full review of our uh, financing needs. So, review of how much we were covered for for how long, and this has prompted basically a decision to approach uh, a new source of financing. That, uh, if you want, we can discuss later on today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and Kevin, what are your thoughts on this topic? So I think that for us, going back to some of your earlier comments, Charlotte, on um, horizon scanning and trying to understand the interconnectivity between different risks and how those business risks, operational risks, financial risks all interplay. I think that you know the, the biggest learning from us came from from kind of all the way back in 08, where in the space of you know a month we saw credit risk, we saw FX risk, we saw interest rate risk, we saw liquidity risk, market risk, legal risk, fraud risk, operational risk. And the, the, the critical thing was that um, when we had historically looked at these risks, these were all things that we'd thought about as a business. Um, and we'd had uh, views as to how likely each of those things might be uh, to come about. But what we hadn't done very well was to assess the correlation between those risks, to assess the fact that actually, when things go wrong, they often go wrong all at the same time. And so um, to, to, to really understand that when you pull on one particular risk, it's going to pull another one up, and that's going to pull another one up. And so you really need to kind of sit and properly plan for the full chain of events, rather than just looking at all of these things in isolation. And I think, um, you know, the other thing that you said was sort of uh, horizon scanning and planning for unexpected risks. And I think that's the key is it's very easy to write a risk management manual or come up with a risk management process for the things that you can perceive, for the risks that you know your business takes, whatever that business might be. What's much harder is to plan for the unknown unknowns. But yet it's those unknown unknowns that are the most likely to hurt you. You know, it's not the things that are in the middle of the distribution that cause you the problems. It's the things that are in the tail that you haven't expected, as, as COVID has taught us. And so, you know, for us, it's very much about planning for the worst case environment, um, assuming that at some point everything will go wrong all at the same time and then trying to kind of build up from there. And of course, 90 plus percent of the time, 99 percent of the time. That doesn't happen. But if you're not prepared for it, that's exactly the point at which you can't then put the processes in place. So I think it, humans are very bad generally at assessing future risk rationally. And we have lots of kind of well-known cognitive biases. And so trying to, to take all of those away and just say, let's assume it all goes wrong and then, and then work from there, I think is a, a really helpful approach. I think that raises a very interesting point about resilience, operational resilience, which has been a focus um, of banking regulators in recent years. And, and I've got no doubt that the work that the banks have done over recent years on operational resilience planning uh, helped them when this pandemic started. And I'm seeing that a concept extended more widely across the corporate sector 
um, the new Bayes proposals for corporate governance will uh, require listed companies and, and, and others to produce a resilience statement, which takes the place of the viability statement that's, that's been in place for a year or two. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a similar concept, but uh, the focus is a little bit different. It, and I, I think, you know, what we've learned from looking at resilience in banking is that um, it's like a step on from risk management. The risk management, you're, you're understanding risks, you're measuring them, you're mitigating them, but then you're left with a risk that, that you're, you're, you're going to um, accept. Um, the question then is, how will you manage your way through a situation where that, that risk arises? And we've actually got an interesting question here from the audience. Why are we experiencing more black swan events? And, um, and, and are we experiencing more black swan events? Um, so there's two questions there. Are, are there more? And, and why, are we, why are there more? <laughs> um, Andrea, what are your thoughts on that question? Well, um... I tried to answer the question, the both questions you asked. The first one, are we experiencing uh, more? Well, I believe we, we live in a quite unstable world, especially from the political point of view. Uh, there is, uh, I mean, the turmoil is part of our life, I believe. Uh, and therefore we need to be ready. So from my point of view, uh, as, we, as, uh, as we are present in 200 countries, I should expect uh, nearly on a weekly basis, political turmoil, at least in one of these countries. And therefore I need to be ready to react immediately. Okay, just in case that the banking system collapse, how else I can, uh, can uh, make uh, the payments of, uh, of our employees, for example. So the operational risk uh, is, uh, is, uh, is my primary uh, you know, um, concern uh, all the time. Um, why we have uh, more of these uh, black ones? ones uh, well, frankly speaking, this is, <laughs> this is a difficult question for, for, for me to understand, but I believe my colleagues today have already raised the point that we live in a very un uh, interconnected world. So when something happens in uh, some places of the world, it's very likely that it has an impact in all the others. Uh, for example, today we are seeing um, the impact, not of the COVID, but the impact of the vaccination or the missing vaccination, which have an impact from one country to another. So if uh, not all the countries reopen uh, at the same time, it has an impact on the air, tra air transport industry because you know all the person decide to stay at home to spend uh, Christmas uh, uh, at home with their families instead of taking a flight because there is a big uncertainty in, in other countries. So we need to get out of this uh, COVID issue all together. Back, back to you, Charlotte. Well, yes, and um, certainly I, I look forward to the time when we can leave COVID behind us, but I, I agree with you. I think it will, its shadow will be hanging over us for a while. Um, Latha, what, what are your thoughts about Black Swan events? Yeah, I think, um, Charlotte, that we've got, a, as sort of Kevin mentioned, a higher level of geopolitical uncertainty and trust in the supply chain all the way through is a little bit not there. And I think that's the level of uncertainty we're now seeing, and therefore we're more likely to then be sort of shock evented by something happening throughout the world. Um, because it's easy to go and do the rose tinted spectacles from, from the past and go when it was all working well. But I would have said when it was all working well, there was a higher level of trust working from country to country and working together and that levels are, are not there to that extent and so there is a level of kind of well if I do this will I be able to bring people on with me or not and that's the right way through the organization um, so I think we've got that what we have done and we, we, you mentioned it as well this time around for example the banking world in my world stepped up supported by the government 
we didn't feel the concerns we had back in 2008, nine, in terms of are the banks going to be there for us? In fact, the opposite. I was very lucky having worked with a lot of banks at that point to be able to talk to other banks in that space. Uh, and people in those banks this time around say, oh, what do we do then? Well, we need to do this. And everyone was helping each other, regardless of who they worked with or worked for. So I think there was a collective response, certainly uh, in, in the world that I lived in, in the UK, where actually people stepped up together and helped each other in a crisis. But I think the wider concern in this question about we're going to get more of these is you need to kind of plan as if you are going to get more of these. We are not in a stable world. Uh, and, and that's the best way of thinking until we feel that feeling that we're back in a stable world, we will need to plan for shocks. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm really pleased to hear, you know, your favorable experience of, of uh, banking yeah. services. I think we have learned a lot as an industry in terms of our culture to be more collaborative and, 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 and customer focused. Um, and, and I'm glad, glad yeah, to that, that came out. Yes. Thank you. Kevin, what are your thoughts on black swans? Well, I think it's the, the question itself is interesting because it, it arguably poses one of those biases that we're not very good at determining in terms of more black swans than when is the question. Like over what time period are we looking for this stuff? You know, if you're trying to assess probability of something happening, you should take the longest run data set you possibly can. And so I don't know if you'd compared us to people who were a few hundred years ago and you asked, are there more unexpected events today than, than now? They probably said, well, no, actually, back then there were way more what they would have called black swans. It's just that for us now, a lot of those things are not black swans anymore because we've removed a lot of the, uh, the unknown, unknown risks to some extent. So I think um, probably if you looked over time, you should expect that black swan type events will happen with some periodicity. I don't know what that periodicity is but they won't happen perfectly every 10 years. You know, you could get a scenario where you have several that happen in a period of time and then a not benign period, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, you're any more or less likely to have the next one because just it very much depends on the, the time period that you're looking over. Um, I do think that the points around interconnectedness are good ones. I think that um, that does potentially make it more likely that these events that may have been more localized historically um, can become more global more quickly. And technology is brilliant in lots of ways, but also you know, can facilitate some of those transmission mechanisms. Um, I think the other thing that's interesting is that from a pure financial risk perspective, we're sort of feeding on the issues of the past to some extent in that, yes, we didn't see the same level of long-term liquidity issues either in the banking sector, in the money markets, and in fixed income markets that we did in 08. But the only reason for that was that the central banks stepped in and injected you know, an, an extraordinary amount of money into the system incredibly quickly. And they, were, you know, they had the playbook from 08 to learn to do that. What we don't know is what the effects of that are going forward. You know, we're now sitting in a world where monetary policy has never dealt with anything like this before. You know, we've, you're starting to see inflation dials flashing at least orange. In, um, in certain parts of the, the developed world. Um, and so I think because you know, we've solved one crisis with a response, that in and of itself is likely gonna lead to new issues and trying to understand what those new issues are and how we manage those and manage our way out of those. Um, you know, maybe not black swan because we can hopefully foresee it a little bit, but, um, but there's definitely some uh, kind of kicking the can down the road that's gone on. And at some point there'll be some reckoning and, and how we deal with that will be, you know, will be a big challenge, I think. Yes, and I would add to that as well as those um, economic risks that we face, there's also a lot of risks around health, including mental health, um, health conditions that haven't been treated during the pandemic because of uh, the, the, the other priorities the medical services had to address. And it's very difficult to assess how that will affect us all, both personally and in amongst, you know, for our, our colleagues in our organisations, but, but also in terms of government spending uh, that may, may be required to, 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 to restore the sort of quality of health that we had before the pandemic started. 
Yeah, exactly. It all comes back to that interconnectedness. It's, you know, you pull on one string one place and something else, another problem appears somewhere, somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got a question now, which is, um, is turning on, uh, I'm going to split it into two, actually. Um, no, maybe it's one. I'll, I'll read it out and you can, you can decide. The question is said, what lessons did the petrol and diesel shortage have? Is the rise of social media a force for good or bad when it comes to creating new risks or managing existing ones? And I suppose what the questioner is thinking of is the fact that um, in the UK, the, the shortage of, 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 of petrol and diesel received a lot of publicity on social media and it caused a, a lot of alarm and um, people filling, filling their tanks and cans of petrol and all sorts of uh, storage taking place, which uh, wasn't normal. And, and, uh, and that was one of the factors contributing to, to the unavailability of in, in the petrol stations. But I think it's a very interesting question more generally about the role of social media in, in global events. And is it, is it good or a bad thing? Lassa, what do you think? Social media, good or bad? <laughs> and any comments about the petrol crisis? I think the thing is, we're, we're, it's here to stay. Yeah. I think we've got to learn to live with it. Um, it's not something that, um, well, it, it, the rise of it has been very significant in the last, say, 10 years in terms of social media. Um, and we've yet to all see how to respond to it. I think that's that's one of the things. Um, it is by its nature um, communication from the individual to the individual, whereas in the past it was very much communication was coming top down, either it's you know at, at a governmental level or whatever it is. This is from human to a human um, a communication, and we've just got to manage it. I think the, the, the thing is. Um, it's when it raises fears of people that we struggle the most. And I think the situation with the petrol situation was it raised people's fear levels. There were people who would, you know, read their, what was happening on the posts and, and, and whatever in social media stroke into, into the tabloids as well. And then they went, oh, I fear that I will not be able to move. I will not be able to drive my car. I therefore need to fill up. And we talk about the toilet roll one as well, isn't it? It's that panic buying situation. So when it stokes people's fears, it's not a good thing, is it? I mean, that's what that's the concern there. But unfortunately, it's it's a it's going to happen. And we probably need a better response mechanism to it. We're talking about risk management, aren't we? And having policies and strategies in place about how do we respond to this? We're talking, I'm personally talking from my corporate level and how do we do that? We almost need that from a government infrastructure level is how you deal with those structures, you know, those fears for the people. And that's something we haven't got yet. We haven't got the response mechanism to that social media. So we kind of need to live with it. We need to find the solutions and the way that we manage risk in a corporate is how do we manage risk as a nation or as a group of nations. So I think that's the gap, if you see what I mean, in, in terms of how we respond to it. But, you know, the individual that I had, who when I was filling up, who was a, an elderly gentleman who was just filling up his car, who just looked, and, you know, sort of basically panicked as he was filling up his car, is that's what it's feeding on, unfortunately, at the moment. Yes, I remember feeling a lot of sympathy. I live in... Central London, I felt a lot of sympathy for the uh, Deliveroo and, and um, Uber Eats drivers who, you know, had, uh, you know, bikes with relatively small tanks. They were, um, y y you know, they couldn't possibly spend the time to queue for five hours or six hours, which if you've got a large SUV, you could probably, you know, it's less of a problem. And um, let's say one of our local petrol stations kept a pump. For the, for the delivery drivers and uh, I thought that was um, that was an admirable thing to do but he did get quite a lot of criticism from other types of drivers. Mm. Andrea what are your thoughts on, on, on your on logistics I imagine the, uh, the petrol and diesel shortage might have had a, a direct impact on your business. What about on social media? 
Well, uh, I'll answer your, the question you raised, uh, giving some examples. So first of all, social media has a huge impact on, uh, on the spread of information across the world. We had just discussed about the, the fact that we are all interconnected. So something that is spread on social media becomes uh, out of the blue area, something that is real, maybe is not real. Okay, so a lot of uh, fake news, but we have a way to respond. So I'd like to, to, I live in Switzerland. First of all, I don't live in the UK. So I have not experienced the, the shortage of fuel that you are referring to, but we can use COVID as an example. In, a, in, in Switzerland, there's never been panic about uh, COVID, but not uh, for, 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 for some serious reasons, because the government uh, has been very present on TV explaining to all the citizens that yes, there is a pandemic. There are some uh, rules that we have to respect, but uh, you know we can handle it. Okay, so also the way they presented give reassurance to the to the people here that we could go through it. Okay, which is not the same in other countries. So I am Italian. I was watching Italian TV at that time. It, they were talking about COVID all the time in every in every kind of transmission, uh, and so it has created a lot of panic. And we can see the consequences today. I mean, it looks like uh, Italy has uh, has moved out of. Uh, of a huge crisis, people are really scared. You've seen that that toll on Italy is not the same than in other countries. Of course, this has a huge impact, but it has an impact on the people mentality way to see the, the risk as well. Uh, coming back to the to the fuel, uh, yes, it has a direct impact on us because when the fuel was down, was down because nobody was moving. <laughs> there was no flight, nobody was using the car, and therefore it went it went even negative. Today, you know, the market is resuming, and the passengers are recontinue are continue are coming back to fly, but the the fuel is increasing. Okay, so uh, what we do in uh, in Cita is. <clears throat> I would say to use this big crisis also an opportunity. So this crisis has also changed the way we handle the business because we are now focused on producing software that allow the customers, for example, to go through check-in without touching anything. So today, our primary attention is to have a, sa a safe and healthy travel. Okay, on one side. On the other side, our business is very much focused on optimizing the routes of the of the of the flights across the world in order to decrease the fuel consumption so these are examples on uh, issues okay and also how we have reacted business wise to address these issues back to you thank you um kevin um what are your thoughts on on social media and also the the diesel and, and petrol crisis well in i think of course it was some, I mean, was in other places as well as the UK to some extent with supply problems. Um, I think Latha used exactly the right word, which is fear. And I think um, if you look at uh, what generally goes on in markets in a lot of uh, human interactions driven by either fee, fear or greed one way or another, um, and when you have something that can amplify those emotions, then it can be quite powerful. And so if you think the petrol crisis, if we sort of try and put it into a treasury risk management context, it was a liquidity crisis, right? Like quite literally a liquidity crisis. And the same is true in markets, you know, whether it's people queuing up outside Northern Rock and people starting to see that there are other people queuing up outside Northern Rock and suddenly everybody's queuing up outside Northern Rock. Or whether it's people in money markets starting to hear over Bloomberg that pricing from one of the banks has moved to a level that indicates that they might be in trouble or whether it's high frequency um, information that people are picking up in trading markets, that something's out of whack in a particular price. Like ultimately, all of this is, um, people are, from a risk management perspective, trying to see what's out there and trying to spot fear and trying to get ahead of other people's actions in order to protect themselves, in order to mitigate their own risks. And so when you have something like social media, which you know, bang, immediately sort of amplifies that fear, everybody's survival instinct kicks in. And that means everybody rushes to the pumps. 
it means everybody rushes to get their money out of their money market funds. It means everybody rushes to, to the bank in order to draw down on their revolving credit facility. And so it's just another example of the fact that all of these things happen at the same time. And in the same way as to your point, you know, well, then when that happens, the delivery drivers can't deliver their food. The taxi drivers can't get people to work. Um, you know, the uh, delivery drivers can't get across the channel. You know, the same thing happens in financial markets. You start to pull liquidity from one place and it causes an issue somewhere else. And so I think, you know, don't get me wrong. I like following some of the sportsmen that I find interesting on social media, but in the context of this sort of thing and risk management, I find it, um, yeah, I find it not particularly helpful. Well, I think it's also an example of the range of risks that we now have to manage as businesses. Um, I mentioned liquidity markets and credit risk at the start of, of this session, but of course, um, operational risk has, has become a much more significant risk um, or, or understanding of it has become much more significant. And I think it's managed much more closely. And reputational risk all, also has been recognized as something that um, can, um, can, can be, present some very fundamental problems to businesses if, if it's not um, managed carefully and, and if businesses don't respond in the right way. And I wanted to, at this point just to mention uh, that, that we have a lot of resources on the ACT website to do with risk management. There's a whole area of the resources uh, library on, on risk management, and you'll find um, some summaries there of the Financial Reporting Council's uh, guidance on, on risk management, uh, and also um, a very comprehensive document on treasury policies, which sets uh, policies in the context of risk and um, I think gives a, a very helpful guide to how you might want to approach uh, managing risk in your organization um, and, and see <clears throat> policies as a response, a, a control if you like, that is there to, um, to mitigate and manage risks um, and, 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 and that risk management should be considered before you sort of leap to the keyboard to start um, drafting new policies. Um, so I really would recommend that to, to everybody. And um, that, that leads me on to um, the question of public disclosure and reporting. Um, increasingly in the UK, certainly for listed companies and public interest entities, we are expected to um, give a lot of information about our principal risks, how we manage those risks, um, what, what, what um, steps we've taken as, as boards to, um, to look at the, um, the controls over risks and indeed um, even to report on control weaknesses that we find and, and what we've done about them. Um, there's a lot of debate on this topic in the UK, whether it's fair because um, many other large businesses currently don't have those disciplines, particularly if they're their own um, by, by private owners. Um, but I think there will be a, it seems the direction of travel is to extend these requirements more widely to at least to large corporations with, with a lot of employees and a lot of assets. And so I, I wanted to ask the panel, what um, what sort their businesses are given to these disclosure requirements and whether that's changed the way they actually manage risk in the business. Latha, would you be able to um, give your, your thoughts on this? I would be, yes, thanks Charlotte. So we've, um, we've taken this very seriously in our organisation and we have already started to actually change over our systems into one system for the entire group, uh, which is, uh, we, we moved on to Microsoft Dynamics. And actually I've just implemented Microsoft Dynamics at our head office, because I'm sort of the, the head of finance PLC as well. And one of the reasons for that is that risk management process and the documentation of the steps you've taken are documented in the system. So that 
what we're anticipating through base and through having to report our resilience and having to report that we've done X, Y, Z, which in our world is a sort of a, an equivalent of Sarbanes-Oxley, it's like socks over here, is that we will be able to demonstrate that from an audit point of view. So it is absolutely clear the steps that are taken and someone could pick those records up and, and check and see if they work. So that's how we're, we're working. We're actually changing the entire group systems. We're all going to go over to it. We just went, um, we went this year or the year just gone. And that's how we anticipate being able to address the verification of making that statement of resilience, if you see what I mean, because it isn't just making the statement. It's now going to be how do you verify that you've actually done it? So, um, so yeah, heavily on the, the system side of it for us as, as the means of a solution to demonstrate how we are doing this. Yes, and that comment on verification is, is very important, really I think. Important. That, you know, it's really important. <laughs> because well, these like public <laughs> disclosures, which um, it, it, particularly if you have listed equity or listed debt, um, it can affect markets and, and the company can be criticised if it doesn't have appropriate backup for the, for the statements. Mm -hmm. Andrea, I know you're in Switzerland where the requirements may be different, um, but actually it'd be very interesting to hear from you what, um, what the views of the Swiss um, regulators are and, um, and whether they're looking for more disclosure in the area of risks and risk management. First of all, we are, um, our head office is in Switzerland, but our mother companies are in, uh, in Belgium and in the Netherlands. Uh, I would say we are not uh, a quoted company, um, but I would say the, the whole public disclosure has changed significantly as CETA also following the, the, the COVID crisis, because as I was uh, hinting earlier in the call, we went to the market, um, to, to basically to the shoe shine market, uh, to to add uh, a significant, uh, an additional financing uh, tool, uh, um, and therefore uh, from that moment on, uh, we have basically put in place a public relations uh, department, and we have uh, from that moment on put in place a regular reporting to all uh, uh, all our investors and all our financial institutions. On a, on a quarterly basis. So if you want, we have a, CETA is a, is a 75 year old company, which has never gone on the market, uh, has been, um, you know, I would say performing very well in the past 75 years without uh, need, need basically to, to, to recur to external debt. So um, this is positive, but at the same time, uh, the, 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 the quote to basically to the, to the shoe shine allow us to become more known outside and um, we were therefore we have been put in a condition to create a, a public uh, relations office and also um, to consistently report to our investors because we are still in a very difficult market so the requests from the investors are uh, are uh, basically received on a daily basis. And therefore, uh, despite we are not quoted, we have put in place a lot of reporting. That's a consequence of COVID as well. Thank you, that, that's really fascinating to, to hear how widespread these, these changes are going to be. Uh, and Kevin, what is your perspective on the greater reporting and transparency requirements? So two different perspectives, maybe one, you know, for us, we're a small private company, ultimately, and so we have no obligation, but we're a regulated fund manager, and I've operated in the regulated fund management space for, for many years now, and it's absolutely standard that in any offering document for almost any financial product, you have to have a section on risks and risk management and how that gets operated. Um, and when our clients come to to evaluate our business and whether it's suitable and whether they're happy to, to put what are ultimately very large sums of money through it. You know, there's a huge focus on the risks and how we mitigate those risks, both from an investment perspective and operational perspective, but also from a, increasingly a technology and a cybersecurity perspective. And so actually we have to do an awful lot of work and uh, be incredibly transparent with our clients, with our investors as to the level of risk management that we're operating within the business. 
I think sort of more generally, as relates to the corporate sector, um, I'm supportive of people putting in place these sorts of requirements because I think that there is a real tendency with risk management. It kind of falls into that. If you've got your categories of problem and they're important or urgent, important and urgent and important, but not urgent, like risk management is often important, but not urgent. And as a result, it's often the important, but not urgent things that don't get done. And yet they're important. Um, and so I think sometimes you need to force people to focus on things like this. You need to force people to put the policies and procedures in place and the disclosures. And that, I think, should lead to better risk management across the industry, which is obviously in, in everybody's interests. Um, whether all of the investors or the regulators who demand the information ever read it, entirely different question. But I think just the fact of having to put this in place um, is, is definitely helpful because otherwise people might just not do it or not do it to quite the right level. Well, a very wise chief executive I worked for earlier in my career used to say that they'll read it if there's a problem. <laughs> And that's when it has to be right. <laughs> um, well, we've you know got a long way through the session without mentioning ESG, and, and I just sort of prompted by your last comment, Kevin. You know, this is all about G, isn't it? And uh, governance. And as you say, it's not necessarily urgent, but it's certainly very, very important. And we've also talked very broadly about businesses and not focused too closely in, on, into treasurer's risk. So I would like to raise very quickly a question about the, the traditional security liquidity yield approach to cash management. Is that still relevant today or do you think it's evolved for treasurers? Andrea. Well, that's a very interesting question because you raise, Charlotte, the ESG. So ESG for us is very important. And this means that for what concerns our investments, so first of all, we are a neutral CO2 emission company, but above all, we belong to an industry which is basically committed okay, to improve the CO2 emission. So there are different ways for us to help the industry to uh, decrease their emissions. Then uh, for what concerns the investments, okay, now we want to invest also, okay, on, um, you know, uh, bonds, equities, whatever, that contains an ESG part of it, okay? So uh, on one side, yes, we need to uh, improve uh, our returns on investment in in a world where basically the yields are really at minimum, but at the same time, we want to invest in companies that are serious about ESG uh, because we need to control the whole chain. Eh? It's not only us, but also the, the, you know, the, the, the banks that work with us and also the companies where we invest that uh, should uh, go into the, all of, all of us should go into the same direction. So on top of the yields, we should also um, monitor these uh, green investments. Well, thank you. Uh, that's that's a very in interesting note as, as we draw to a close. And I wonder if I could ask uh, Latha, we probably only have one minute, I'm afraid, but any thoughts on, is it still mainly SLY or, or have other um, matters come yeah. into looking at cash management? I think other matters will come into cash management. I think that the recent history has been very much uh, weighted to security rather than anything else that, you know, if we're going to place on deposit, the money will still be there when we come to, to get it out again. Um, that was our priority through through the certainly the, the first um, six months, at least, of 2020. Um, but increasingly, we're going to be looking as part of our wider ESG statements on where we invest our money, what we put our money into, what even capital projects we look at in terms of our sites, what we're investing in. So, um, yeah, it's going to evolve. But certainly at the moment, from a purely Treasury's perspective, security has been the main concern for me. That's very interesting. And Kevin, your thoughts on this? Uh, so very quickly, I think security, liquidity, yield, yes, absolutely, from all of our clients, that's still probably the general order. I think if you're in euro and you're losing 70 or 80 basis points, then maybe that yield question, because what does what does security mean if you're already losing money to some yeah. extent? And so I think people, you, you kind of have to look at the currency as to exactly how you position this stuff. Um, absolutely on ESG, we're seeing big demand from our clients for transparency 
in the ESG space. We're seeing significant demand from our issuers to try and issue ESG or sustainable friendly um, financing. And so, yeah, maybe we'll get to um, security, liquidity, yield, sustainability or something in, in a couple of years time. Yeah, I don't know. Well, thank you. Sustainability is a great note to end this session on. And I have also learned how central uh, corporate treasurers are in, in the management of, of their businesses, which is very much the message that we at the ACT uh, want to spread both amongst our membership and to the wider business community. So very many thanks to all of the panellists for giving such a, a wonderful explanation of, of their views on risk management and the future uh, that, that all of this holds for us as corporate treasurers.